What's up, Yukon Nation? And welcome back to the second episode of Girls' Night. I'm your host, Catherine Chardon, alongside Julia Gintoff, Natanya Archibald, and Tamara Thacker as we bring you all things NBA and counting down the NBA Finals. Let's get into it. So, ladies, the first question I have for you. As we know, NBA Finals, Miami versus Lakers. Right now, we're looking at Game 5, Friday night at 9 p.m. What do you think the Lakers need to do in order to be NBA champs within one more game? Or what do you think Miami has to do in order to force a Game 6? To be honest... Miami is the problem here. The Lakers, I feel like Miami's been pretty much not competitive throughout this whole series, um, mainly due in part to the dominance of AD. He's absolutely destroyed them. Given Dragic is out, that is not only devastating for him, but devastating for the Miami fan base, the entire team. Adebayo is out. Game two is an embarrassment. Um, it's really going to come down to rebounds. Miami's been significantly out-rebounded. Now that Bam Adebayo is back, second team all-defensive player, um, we really need him to step up, take care of LeBron and um, AD in the paint. And if he can do that, then they should be able to hold them off. It also comes down to the play of Jimmy Butler. This is the time, this is the most important game for the Miami Heat of the season. If Jimmy can turn on GOAT mode again, like he did in game three, I think that they can take this one. I have to agree with Julia Nolbet. From watching the whole entire series so far, the Lakers, they have a chip on their shoulder. They have so much baggage on their shoulders. And when you look at them, they're just too big compared to Miami. You have LeBron James, AD. You have all these big centers. The way they play the pick and roll game, it's scary, especially if you watched the highlights from last night. The pick and roll game was AD. Oh, my goodness. Like, especially when the Miami Heat tried to guard they look like no children out there. Like LeBron James was having a festival. Like it was his own little house and he was bawling out there. But one thing I noticed with the Miami Heat is that, yeah, you, one thing that hurt them the most was the injuries. They, they were good throughout the whole entire Eastern Conference, but when they got to injuries, they just kind of fell apart. And I know that we have Jimmy Butler and we have other people who could step up, but I really just think, the, the Lakers are just too big, too strong, and they have a chip on their shoulder. And I don't think the Miami Heat will have a chance to win. Because usually teams who are 3-1, and one, they don't really come back. And even though Jimmy Butler said, oh, we are, our confidence are not, is not shaken because we are down 3-1. But we'll see when, we, when Friday comes. But I just feel like LeBron James is just going to end it as he usually does. You know, I 100% agree. I mean, LeBron's 35 playing at the, the level that LeBron is playing at. He's playing like he's a youngin again. I mean, he has he's averaging 27.8 points per game, 11 rebounds per game, and 8.5 assists per game. Like, for LeBron to be doing that at 35 years old and to be carrying a team that he – has not been playing for for his whole career it's insane to just see that LeBron can be doing this right now at his age in the finals but also just going to talking about the heat I mean if the heat can pull out game five and possibly make it to game seven they're gonna have to worry about injuries I mean they've been playing like uh Bam um obviously draw uh Dragic but I mean if they can make it to game seven they're going to have to stay healthy. And I think that's probably the biggest factor for them. But other than that, I think LeBron and AD are just too dominant right now. I really don't think anybody can stop LeBron or AD at this point right now. If the Heat can, they have to shut down LeBron James yeah. or AD. They need to figure out a way to do that. But I, think, I just think the team's too small to be able to do that compared to the size of AD and LeBron James and the power of LeBron James. So Yeah, I just think – if the Heat, if the Heat really want to have a chance to win the series, I think that they just have to step up defensively and just be smart. Um, and also, just how AD is just so dominant right now. He's shooting fifty five percent from three point range. Like, the, if they cannot stop that, Miami has absolutely no chance of winning the series. Yeah, they can have all the offense in the world. It's gonna come down to defense. 
Um, and that's the biggest thing. AD has demolished them. Like I said, game two is an absolute embarrassment. Even last game, game four, like it was close, but I never like felt in my heart that Miami was going to win that. Like I knew the Lakers had it all the way through. I mean, in the fourth quarter, you could just see how every time the every time Miami scored, uh, either it was LeBron, AD, they would just come back and have a response to every single every single score, pretty much. There's no stopping LeBron. Did when you see him against basket, Hero? So he just he just flew <laughs> over across the court. LeBron, LeBron, <laughs> but no, pretty much that just goes to show nobody can stop LeBron going to the basket full speed. He's too big. He's too aggressive. He's too strong. And having someone, especially like Tyler Hero, he could not he could not handle the aggressiveness of LeBron. And pretty much if the Heat want to even have a look at game six or game seven, they're going to have to learn to play defense against LeBron. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Yeah, these are all great points. Neutralizing that three-point shooting between AD and LeBron. I know LeBron was struggling from the three-point line yesterday night. But like you said, Tamara, when he drives, it's over. And then also my, with Miami, you know, it's just going to be about like that extra juice in the tank. I, I don't know if they have it with the injuries, but we'll see. It's going to be fun on Friday. Personally, I can't wait because this is the closest that LeBron's been this early yeah. and I just need that to happen. But I try not to. I mean, usually that. LeBron is on the opposite side of the 3-1. So, yep. Let's hope that so, he can just finish it and by right it's now. It's so interesting because I was reading something that said that Pat Riley, if he wins, the Miami Heat will have their 10th – he will have his 10th championship with Miami Heat. Yeah. And it, I guess it's like his fifth um, – Pat Riley's the GOAT. <laughs> yeah. And then, yes, the godfather. I guess someone said that on our chat, the godfather. Um, Looking ahead to next season as we transition over. So we've seen – a lot of changes within coaching staffs I know the switch up and kind of kind of a surprise I would say I don't know everything that's happening in Philly signing Doc Rivers that's going to be a change coming from the west going to the east and then along with Mike D'Antoni uh, being at not renewing his contract with the Houston Rockets where do you guys see that changing and how might this help with the league or these specific teams in general and then overall, how do you think changing from the West to the East will cause either difficulty or it might even cause some relief? Um, let's see. Natanya, do you want to take this one first? Sure. When you had this question, I was like, gosh, why why Mike D'Antoni? <laughs> like, we saw, like, <laughs> like, we, like, I feel like no matter what team he goes to, I don't think it's going to be a good situation. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> that's, that's what, after I oh, see that, I'm giving you enough oh. evidence. Mike D'Antoni, oh, is, Mike, I'm sorry, but Mike D'Antoni, he's done so much for the Rockets. I mean, even though he couldn't pull off a championship or even making it to uh, finals, he's done so much for the Rockets. And I, I know that he, he said that, his reason for leaving is because he just felt disrespected by the ownership. But uh, I just think that he's done so much for the Rockets that he's too good of a coach to not get another coaching job any like soon. Oh, he will. He definitely will. I'm thinking he's either going to go. I don't know who would want to go to Indiana at this point to be completely <laughs> honest <laughs> because Oladipo might even leave. So yeah, I don't really, they really have nothing there. Um, I'm really interested to see who gets the Pelicans job. I was I just want, gonna do that. Yeah, I kind of want Tyron Lue to take it, but he might just slide into the Clippers spot. Um, the mm. Pelicans have that young mm. core. Like, you can shape them to how you want them to be. Um, Tyron Lue would be perfect for that. He has that connection with the players, not only on the court, but on a personal level as well. And I think that three, four years to come, that core of Zion Williamson, Lonzo Ball – um, most improved player, Brandon Ingram, uh-huh. that could be lethal in a couple of years. Like once they're older, once they get an experience. So yeah, that's, that's going to be really interesting to see. who I, gets have, that job. I have a question. Do you girls think that the age of the coach matters? Because someone like Tyron Liu, he can communicate and get on the same level as those players, but someone like Mike D'Antoni, 
he might have a little bit more problem because of his age and the certain um, language that he plays. But I mean, I feel that because of, even though Mike D'Antoni is an older coach, I think he has so much experience in the league that it really doesn't matter. But obviously, I feel like probably from a player's perspective, they would uh, they would probably prefer a younger coach as someone who can connect to them. And obviously, Tyron Lowe played in the league, so he can connect with them on a deeper level. But I also think that no matter if it's Mike D'Antoni or Tyron Lowe, I think they'll both do a pretty good job. I think Mike D'Antoni will just do a, a better job and a better job connecting with the players if they – are more if they're more experienced players and just players who can work their way around uh, adversity. Yeah, I think that as long as you're an older coach and you're willing to adapt, because the NBA is constantly changing, it's now more of a three-point game. The mid-range is basically gone. I think as long as you're able to adapt, age doesn't necessarily matter. But if you're stuck in your old ways, like you're yeah. going to get washed out completely. I mean, I think Doc Rivers is a pretty good example. I, he came from Boston went to the Clippers and now he's with the Sixers I mean I think the Sixers are a pretty young team um although they've been like Embiid um and Ben Simmons have been with each other for a couple years now I think they're still young so I feel like Doc Rivers being experienced it kind of it's kind of the same situation as Mike D'Antoni um pretty much just he's so experienced that he can go to like whichever team in the league and probably um, have success. Yeah. I'm not even going to get into how much he disappointed me with the Clippers this year. <laughs> That's fine. I, I don't think that, okay. Let's be honest. That is not Doc Rivers. Fault. It's, yeah. Kawhi made me sad. Paul George made me really sad. I don't even hype. know. It was there. the hype. <laughs> Media <laughs> drove it. But let's be honest. You could say the same thing about the Lakers and the Lakers are, about to win their <laughs> championship right now. It's so true. Hopefully. And in Philly, Doc has a lot of work to do. I mean, this year, the Sixers were less than impressive. I think that it's mainly because they have one of the biggest lineups in the league. They have the bigger guys, and that matches up so poorly with teams that are going small. A lot of teams are starting to go small. They have the exact opposite problem as the Rockets right now, where they need a really good ball handler. They need another guard that can be a three-point threat. Um, but they're sort of in a financial bind right now. Like Tobias Harris, Al Horford, Ben Simmons, and B, they all have huge contracts. So he's going to need to shake up this course somehow, and that's probably going to mean letting someone go. And I think if he lets someone go, I haven't really heard many trade rumors at all. Yeah. But if I were him, Embiid would probably be the guy. You got all these big guys – you're going to get someone really valuable for Embiid. So I think that mm -hmm. by doing that, you're, the core can be remedied, but they need to fix their issue with the big guys because everyone – the Celtics series is a perfect example. Like, they're too quick for them. I really think that the Sixers just really need – obviously they have superstars in Philly, but I just think they need to find their role players – I think they need to find those guys who can come off the bench and really be helpful to those big guys and to their key players. I think other teams have been success successful because they're finding those role players and people who support their big guys well, and I just don't think the Sixers have found those guys yet. Well, that missing puzzle piece. I remember yeah. J.J. Redick had said something recently Yeah. How being that the Sixers traded him away or something, it was like they they really messed up there because that would have been that – that no, I don't know that it would be seamless. I don't know that. But I do think that if they just waited it out between Ben and himself and Embiid together, the three of them, we could see something different. Um, also, mentioning Billy Donovan in Chicago, I really would like to see what he does with Zach Levine. I know Zach Levine is a pure talent, and I really – want to see him level up in that regard. Um, so we will see. I mean, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be a little different. I hope that we see teams kind of come out of the ground like we didn't think we were. So it'll be interesting to see um, looking forward. Um, for our last question, I would like to talk about looking ahead and what you guys think the next NBA season will be like. Will there be a different – start date will there be 
more games at certain times and less games? And will there be talk of a bubble? And what are your thoughts about it? How do you feel? And what do you think is probably the best system moving forward? I just say about the bubble, if it's not broken, don't fix it. <laughs> because we have seen other teams, other sports organizations try to do deal with this COVID situation without a bubble. And we see COVID tests, positive tests, and especially with the Titans, 22 positive tests after two days of testing. That's crazy. But I think the NBA season might start next year. Give the players a few months to rekindle themselves and just relax yeah. after the whole bubble situation and being away from family. But I think the season might be a little bit longer I'll be interested to know like how they're going to set up the bubble. Is it still going to be at Disney or are they going to do like the East coast at Disney world and the West coast at Disneyland? (laughs) It's going to be, yeah, no, I think the bubble is probably the best scenario for the NBA right now, just because so many other leagues are seeing those struggles with COVID and the cases rising. But I I think one thing that will be interesting is seeing how how players transition from college basketball into the NBA. Those rookies who who knows what's going to really the happen. Draft. With the, we haven't even had the with draft and with and with um, those players who are going to be coming into the NBA. So I think that's going to be interesting to see how they transition. But I mean, I agree. I think the bubble was wor- is working perfectly. There's no need to change it. Um, probably the only thing is. The fact that the the t- their time in the bubble was so small because they had such a long break, so I think they will take this after the finals are over. I think they will take a pretty long time before they um, start playing again because, especially you could see right now with the Heat, they need that time to recover. They need that time for their bodies to just rejuvenate, pretty much. Yeah. No, I think. Last I heard, I don't know the validity to it, start date January 2021 to possibly going into July. Um, But everything is so up in the air. I mean, this COVID thing, they've been predicting it's going to get worse in the winter. So if we do have to go into a possible quarantine again, will some players want to opt out? We don't know. The vaccine could also come and we could totally be fine. So it's going to be very interesting to see. All of next season is going to be very interesting to see. Like the Nets with Steve Nash, Katie and Kyrie, there's finally going to be a really big force possibly in the East. And then as much as I hate to say it, Golden State could also be good to go again, which. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. God. About that. Let's I, know. I mean, think about all those teams that didn't get into the bubble. who are like going to be hungry for like next season. I Especially. mean, but even just like, even like Phoenix, they had a, had so much success in the bubble Mm -hmm. but didn't end up making it to the playoffs so that's I feel like they're going to be a team who's going to be really hungry in the next season we could talk about contracts I mean the NBA has lost lots of money due to COVID so we'll see how contracts play out Mm -hmm. are players going to get the full guaranteed money they usually get so we'll have to see Mm -hmm. I mean I think the when it comes to contracts i think it'll probably it w- i feel like it won't affect um the big players as much like obviously like lebron ad like um paul george Kawhi. like i think the big players will be fine um but i think it'll be like the smaller um role players or t- or even players who weren't in the bubble and didn't play this season And then you have the whole conversation about G League and how a lot of the really good basketball players are from high school are transitioning, getting that 500K in the G League and how that's all going to work out. That's going to be very interesting as well. Are they going to have enough money? That's a good point to Julia as well. And then what also Samara was saying, even talking about the draft in detail, we really didn't get to that. But just imagining what their a rookie season would be like in a bubble and in a pandemic. Like, I think the only player, well, possibly not, probably not the only player, but Matisse Thibault was the only one to really be like showing it through his lens. But at the same time, he was saying how this was his rookie year. Like it kind of got turned on its head. So that's really interesting to see. Um, Definitely going to be 
it's going to be different. It's going to be weird. I, sacrificing Christmas Day games is going to be something I have to part with for this year. I mean, yeah. that's fun. I mean, but it is what it is. And it's all in the player's best interest at this time, especially between even families. I mean, the fact that Gordon Hayward, like, if it weren't for his ankle injury, then he would be staying in the bubble and then would be able to leave for the birth of his son. And then because of the ankle injury, he was already home. He had to make that sacrifice and not be there for the birth. So these players have been asked with a lot of them. And the way that I feel the NBA has handled it is as professional as it can be at this time. I think they've set a great precedent and we can only see what happens from there. Um, to wrap I up. I have oh, I, sorry, you go. an idea for making up for Christmas Day. We have NCAA Christmas Madness. <laughs> I love it. Like, as long as they're playing on there. One day of games, too. It shouldn't be, like, a whole big thing. It should just be, like, like round robin or something. That'd be so fun. But so going off of what you said, Catherine, I didn't even – just thinking of how so many NBA players have been away from their families, I think that will play – that will be a big factor in, as to when the next season will start. Because, mm-hmm. I, I mean, you have to give th- these players who have been playing – in the bubble time to with their families. I mean, they've been away from their families for yeah. a while now. So Making birthdays, school, exactly. birthday so school. I think you really need to give players and just whether it's injuries, just family time. I think players need that, especially during a time like COVID. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Um, to wrap up, we are continuing with our women in sports segment, which is highlighting women in the field, and this. This week, we actually have shout out to Seattle Storm, who just won their another title for the WNBA Finals Championship. That means Stewie notching her second MVP award in three years. Sue Bird with her fourth title. So shout out to those UConn women getting it done. In did they blow them out? They did blow them out. Yep. Three, three, three to zero. So shout out to them. Looking ahead next week, we hope to talk about the NFL and how they are also dealing with COVID and our MVP predictions. For now, I thank you to Julia Gintoff, Natanya Archibald, Samara Thacker. I'm Catherine Sheridan for UCTV Sports.